Indigenous peoples in India, some of whom are known as Adivasis, have been historically dispossessed of customary land rights and displaced from ancestral lands. The majority of Indigenous peoples in India live in forest lands. Displacement began in the 1700s when, in then colonial India, forest lands were recognised as being resource rich and were expropriated for economic reasons. Legislation was enacted to facilitate this economic exploitation of forest lands for extractive industry. After independence from colonial rule, the Indian government continued these policies of displacing indigenous forest peoples from their lands. This displacement has taken place not only for large-scale industrial extraction, but now also in the name of conservation. And the new legislation reflects this. The Wildlife Protection Act of 1972 and the Forest Conservation Act of 1980 are examples of the newer legislation under the Indian government, which has relied on excluding communities, undermining ancestral land rights, and perpetuating what is known as ecological imperialism. In 2006, the Forest Rights Act was enacted in India. It is a landmark social justice law addressing displacement, recognizing land rights of indigenous forest peoples in India for the first time, and aiming at land tenure security. Besides restoring customary land rights, the Forest Rights Act contributes to a more structured conservation approach to increase tribal participation in the management of forest lands and it recognizes community forest rights. Framed in progressive rights-based language, it has forced a new paradigm in which rights are now recognized, land rights for indigenous peoples. Looking at the issue of displacement of Adivasis from the perspective of indigenous land rights, the questions to be asked are, how can the competing issues of indigenous rights and of ecological conservation work in harmony to ensure both forests and their inhabitants are protected. Also, from a gender perspective, how does being displaced from their lands affect women differently, especially given that indigenous women are the knowledge holders of natural resource management, food and medicinal plants, for example, and women are the traditional custodians of forest biodiversity. I'm out here in the full country, here in the peatlands of Caithness. This is a massive area of expan an expanse of blanket bog. Many people see this as an empty landscape. However, it's an emptied landscape. This place used to be home to hundreds and hundreds of people until the forces of capitalism in around 1829 cleared the people off the land to make way for sheep. This has left a landscape that has no people in it, a landscape that is managed for various different types of livestock, then sheep, then grouse, now deer. There's no people here anymore. Miles and miles of empty land. Just behind me is an area of slightly better ground that was managed for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years through the practice of transhumans, where around this time of year, the people in the neighbouring towns and um, townships would come up with their cattle and live out here in what are called shealings for months at a time um, to reap the benefits of this better ground, this better grass. That also came to a crashing end when the sheep came and the landlords cleared and evicted the people off the ground in what is now known as the Highland Clearances. I don't always look back, however I like to look forward and it's part of my work to set out a new vision for land, this landscape. A lot of the question comes down to who owns the land. That side of this little road is an environmental NGO. This side of the road is landed gentry. To me, I think we need to answer the land question to be able to answer how the land is managed. Um, but for many people, they want to be able to manage the land under the current land ownership, for better or for worse. 
To me, this is a landscape that has huge amount of potential, socially, economically, culturally, environmentally. It's hugely important for the environment. However, it lacks culture, it lacks people, it lacks society. We need to have people back in this landscape. A few more months from now, the rain will come. The cistern will fill up. The plants will drink, we will drink, and I will baptize my skin in its very waters. And we will survive, the way we have before. Another summer, another unjust war, another cruel reality. You see, a hundred million years ago, we were ocean. And a hundred million years later, we are fighting not to become a desert. A hundred million tries and a hundred million defiant acts, a hundred million seeds and a hundred million plants and a hundred million trees, and a hundred million of us and we will survive. So good morning, everyone. Uh, good day, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be. Welcome to the Architecture Fringe. Uh, if you're new to the Fringe, a warm welcome to you. Uh, and if you join us before, welcome back. Thank you for being here. Uh, we really do appreciate it. Uh, my name is Andy Summers. I'm a co-founder and co-director of the Architecture Fringe. And along with my colleagues here, Leanna Bauer Cam, and Cam Chan, who welcome you to this online space. Uh, the festival opened on Thursday evening with a live broadcast from Glasgow. Um, so thanks so much if you were there, it was pretty fun. Uh, and this is the first event of this year's core program. Uh, for the Architecture Fringe 2021, uh, our provocation is unlearning, uh, where we encourage participants to interrogate behaviors, beliefs and biases in order to acknowledge how the world really is to then reimagine how it could be. Uh, this is Homelands uh, with uh, Unlearning from Indigenous Worldviews with Magnus Davidson, Indrani Sigamani, Vivian Sansur and Miriam Halawi Abraham. So good morning to you all. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> <laughs> thank morning. you so much for being here. Uh, and thank you to Vivian because it's really quite early for, for, for you on the west, uh, east coast of the States there. So thanks so much for being with us. Um, so I'll just do some quick housekeeping for you all. Um, this is an online space, so thank you very much and welcome. Um, the chat function is, is there to, to use, so um, as we go through uh, the provocations and the event, please feel free to put any questions that you might have in the chat, and we'll come on to that um, later in the event. Um, and also for accessibility, along the bottom of everybody's screen, you should be able, if you make your Zoom full screen, uh, you should see CC Live Transcript. Um, along the bottom there. So if you want to turn on uh, live transcription, um, the, um, the text will come up um, beneath the screen. So it's your choice if you'd like to do that or not. So feel, please feel free to turn that on if you like for the subtitles. Um, and I think that's maybe all the housekeeping. Cam, is there anything else? Nope, just remember that this is a Zoom meeting. So you're, you have the option to turn on your cameras if you so wish to do so to engage with everyone but we do re recommend that everyone just remains on mute if they're not speaking just to make sure that everyone doesn't pick up any background noise yeah we have we have uh, zoom meetings around webinars because it's try it's nice to try and see people's faces as we're still sort of half hybrid online so uh, feel free to turn your camera on if you like um but i will hand over now to liana who will introduce Miriam. Hello, good morning, everyone. It's really lovely to have everybody here today for this really exciting chat about land. Um, so I'm really delighted to introduce our chair, Miriam Halavi-Abraham, who's joining us to, today from uh, Ethiopia. 
Miriam is a multidisciplinary designer from Addis Ababa. With a background in architecture, she works with digital media and spatial design to interrogate themes of equitable futurism, experimental conservation, and intersectionality. She holds an MFA in Interaction Design from the California College of Art and a VR in the Architecture from uh, the Glasgow School of Art. She currently works as a game code instructor at Bay Area Video Coalition News Program, <clears throat> excuse me, where she teaches uh, social justice driven game design. She is a CCA Mellon researcher for the Digital Now Multidisciplinary Project, a fellow of the Zachary Watson Education Fund and the Graham Foundation 2020 grantee. Uh, she's also a contributor for the Phenomenalist and has recently written an editor editorial on space and politics of her hometown in Addis Ababa. Um, and with that, I just hand over to Miriam, and I'm really delighted, Miriam, to have you here today to join us for that conversation. Thank you so much, Leanne. Um, I'm really excited to be joining Architecture Fringe, although from afar. Um, I have the great pleasure of introducing our incredible lineup of speakers today who will all take us along on a journey of unlearning from indig Indigenous and traditional worldviews. Um, to quote the author Yu Gui, we as terrestrial beings have always already landed, but it doesn't mean we know where we are. We are disoriented by planetarization, like looking at the earth from the moon, we no longer notice the land beneath our feet. By moving through the distinct localities and contexts that our speakers are engaged with, today we'll begin to see the interconnectedness of their ecologies, their communities, and also begin to see the emergent strategies that are born from their endeavors. So our first presenter is Magnus Davidson, a research associate with with the University of the Highlands and Islands Environmental Research Institute based in Thurso, um, Scotland. As a native of the Highlands, Magnus's work focuses on setting out a new vision for 21st century rural Scotland, which works for both the people and nature and re reverses centuries of depopulation and ecological degradation. Next up will be Indrani Sigamani, a researcher and senior international development consultant working with social justice, gender, and human rights based in Oxford, England. Indrani's research explores legal responses to, this, to the displacement of Adiwasi, or mobile indigenous peoples, from their ancestral lands in India. And then lastly, we'll, heal, we'll hear from um, Vivian Sansur, who, with a background in anthropology, works as an artist, an independent scholar, and conservationist um, directly with farmers on issues relating to agriculture and independence. As the founder of the Palestine Heirloom Seed Library, Vivian is working on bringing back threatened varieties back to the dinner table so history and heritage can become part of our living culture rather than relics of the past. So I'll hand it over to our first speaker, Magnus, now. Excellent, many thanks, Miriam. Let me just share my screen here. Hopefully everybody can see this. Excellent. Everybody, I can hopefully get a nod on the screen. Um, many thanks for inviting me along this morning. Um, it's a great pleasure to share a stage with um, everybody here. Um, it's just um, really nice to be able to talk about some of these things on a Saturday morning as well. Um, so I've got a few slides that I'll kind of try and get through. So first of all, just by way of introduction, um, thanks Miriam for that fantastic introduction. My job at the university really um, looks at investigating these interactions between the environment, the economy and society. I'm a social scientist embedded um, in an environmental research institute, which is really quite nice. I'm also a director of Community Land Scotland. We're a membership organization which aims to promote community land ownership in Scotland as well. And we'll get on to why that's important in a couple of later slides. Um, I'm also a trustee of various organizations involved in local heritage, local development, at a community scale. Um, so it's just trying to cover um, or showcase that covering different scales here. Um, I'm from, live and work in the Highlands of Scotland. I've got a real sense of place, a real um, feeling, a real um, yeah, sense of place here in the Highlands. Um, it means a huge part um, of, uh, of my life, really. You can see me pictured there with my dog. I think she makes, um, or one of my dogs, she makes an appearance in some other pictures going through. Um, so I first wanted to address the word indigenous from a Scottish sense because um, it's, I, I feel it's really important, um, particularly as we're going forward in some of this discussion. And it's first of all to say that Scotland has no recognised indigenous peoples. We do, however, have two indigenous language, Gaelic and Scots. Um, 
I won't talk about Scots today, incredibly important, but I will focus a bit on Gaelic. The pre-clearance people, and we'll touch on what the clearances were, but um, just as context, the pre-clearance people are commonly referred to as indigenous people, so the Gaeltac, and that's the Highlands of Scotland. Um, in the history books, however, post-clearances, um, that term is not very much used. Some people, some organisations, uh, particularly on the right hand side here, you will see the Scottish Crofters Federation have proposed indigenous status for crofters and or Gaelic speakers, generally a combination of the two, to help protect minority language um, and culture. Some people and organisations use indigenous knowledge as a synonym for traditional knowledge, more so in the landed estates. It's not a debate um, I feel that I'm qualified to enter I, as neither a Gael nor a crofter, but it is a debate that's ongoing. And I have friends that fall on both sides of this, some vehemently opposed and some absolutely um, uh, in, uh, proponents. Um, these are contentious terms and proposals, particularly considering the role that the Highlands, Scotland and the United kind Kingdom have in colonialism and empire. Um, it should go without saying um, that, yeah, these should be contentious terms um, because of this. I won't use the term here again because of the, 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 the connotations, but the, the, I'll rather use cultural, tra traditional, local or a blend of all three. Um, my use of this as well is inclusive. The Scottish Crofters Federation's aspirations um, or previous aspirations around Indigenous status, as you can see on the right hand side, is inclusive. It's also, I think, important, and I've put this in, to recognise the privilege I experience every day because of my race, gender, nationality and such like, um, and particularly in, when we're discussing some of these issues. On the bottom right hand side, actually, I've put a, a picture of a plaque at my own university's executive buildings in the Highland capital, recognising that that building was um, built with the proceeds of slavery. So I just wanted to address some of the terminology here before, before we get going. Again. I've tried to then take on board the, the unlearning proposal, the unlearning theme in this various, uh, in this presentation. Hopefully I try and do it some justice, whether or not I've done it right, I'll let you be the judges of that. Um, but this is my personal unlearned, unlearned experience, experience exploring these ecological principles um, from my own era here in the North Highlands and how this might um, um, be important in the 21st century. On the left hand side, you can see this most beautiful stone. This is from the top of Ben Hope. I took probably a number of years ago, but I just thought it was a lovely wee picture taken from my Instagram feed, which you'll see is a theme going forward. Um, so in terms of unlearning our landscapes, Scottish society holds a romantic view of the Highlands as remote, unspoilt, empty of people. Our landscapes here, however, have been negatively impacted by the concentrated land ownership, so a lot of land owned by very few people, capitalism itself over hundreds of years, and the systematic destruction of Highland culture or cultures over the last 200 plus years ago. I'll propose the creation of a more socially and environmentally just landscape by taking inspiration from pre-clearance times via three different proposals. Repeopling landscapes, so that's putting people back into landscapes that have been emptied, protecting and promoting the Gaelic language and supporting community ownership of land. The last one's perhaps a bit tenuous to propose its pre-clearance, but something um, I'm quite keen on and I think kind of fits quite nicely. So the area I'm talking about is very much focused on the north of Scotland. This is what we would call uh, the two historic counties of Caithness and Sutherland. I'm located in Thurso. Um, and I've put some, put some um, dots on the map here of where um, my family, my partner's family, and so therefore my daughter, um, various previous generations were cleared from. And it's very much the reason that we live in Thurso today rather than in some of these more inland areas. I've put an orange arrow on the right hand side to show where I'm originally from in Cromarty, just out with this area. This is what the area, or this is what many people think the area looks like, and it's very true. It's absolutely stunning, these coastal cliffs, these big peatland bogs, these beautiful hills. Perhaps the traditional highland landscape, perhaps playing on the traditional highland landscape, we don't have as big hills, um, but it's absolutely stunning, beautiful location. Um, Unbelievable, unbelievable place to live. 
It's also a very industrious area. We export a huge amount of renewable energy and we've got the world's fourth largest offshore wind farm. We've got the world's largest tidal array. We produce thousands and thousands of percent of our um, own energy demand. This is another huge aspect of my work, which I'll completely disregard today, but I'm more than happy to pick up some themes um, in, in, in the later questions. But it's just to showcase this juxtaposition of beautiful landscapes as well as industrial and productive landscapes. So learning the land, Scotland has an unusually concentrated pattern of land ownership in an international context. We've got some of, if not the most concentrated land ownership in the Western world. This has come via the clan system being um, largely thanks to the force of forces of capitalism encompassed by enclosure and clearance. Um, so the clan system was where the clan um, chief um, generally um, and presided over the area of the land, they gradually turned from the clan chief into landowners. Many estates purchased in the West Highlands and Islands, and this is actually more so for the whole of the Highlands and Islands, but the research has only recently been done on the West Highlands and Islands um, because of limitations in terms of budget, were funded through profit from the slave trade. So it's just, again, showcasing that some of the, the what I'm talking about today has all of these international links to imperialism, colonialism, and we should be taking that into consideration. It's an unregulated market, and I propose it's an unjust land system. This concentrated land ownership causes significant and long-term damage to the communities affected. We have traditional lairds, new green lairds, and the corporates looking to green offset their emissions elsewhere in the world. So this is a landscape of clearance. The Highland clearances were the evictions of tenants across the Highlands and Islands between 1750 and 1860. Under the guise of agricultural improvement, people were evicted from their homes in the inland to the coast to make way for sheep. Sheep were more profitable than people. The evictions were often violent and they brought the end to the practice of transhumans where people lived in the townships, however, moved up to the hills, the better grazing during the summer and lived in shealings up on the hills and presided over their uh, flocks and mainly uh, cattle rather than sheep. As the, um, the, 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 the market forces um, changed the price or that you could get from sheep, grouse and then deer replaced the sheep. This is what landscapes of clearance look like. What are beautiful landscapes, but emptied of people. You do come across houses looking like this. These are shepherd's houses. They're all, um, are largely all um, decrepit now. Nobody lives in them. Even the shepherds that came with the sheep to replace the people have now gone. These are emptied landscapes. These houses are all actually built on what we would call townships, collections of houses, communities. And these townships, those previous houses were quite often built with the stones of these houses. So these townships litter the whole area that we're talking about, were once the home to many people and now devoid of people. When the people went, along came the degradation of the environment. So the sheep overgrazed the land, the deer overgrazed the land, no trees come through. To look after the livestock, quite often the ground has been burnt. Um, we've seen a forestation, we see sheep, we see too many deer on the land, we see land that's been exploited for very few, uh, for the few people in terms of sporting uh, estates. Much of this practice still exists and is supported um, by capital, external capital, subsidy or tax breaks. So this environmental degradation that came post clearance is still very much in play in this area. So why am I focusing on events that happened 200 plus years ago? Because we're still living with the results, our landscapes are still shaped by these events and our futures are still shaped by these events. The landscapes of clearance are protected, intentionally or not, in environmental planning and landscape policy and designation. And although some protections are now in place, landscape scale changes in a negative way are still positive via concentrated land ownership. On the left hand side, we have the Scotland's wild land map. So this protects land for the um, quality of looking wild. However, many of these areas are cleared landscapes. So getting to my first provocation, repeopling. 41 families were evicted from this strath. This landscape was, a peopled, repeop was peopled until at least the 60s. It's now managed as a nature reserve with sporting use for, and, and uh, it's managed as a nature reserve and conservation with sporting use, walked up grouse and deer. 
the landowners, the two of them, one's an environmental NGO and one of them's a traditional lord, they benefit from this landscape of clearance, less disturbance from people and the sporting interests benefit from the exclusion of people. However, I would love to repeople this landscape. Part of my work is talking about how we can repeople re this landscape, land, people and culture. Could we reintroduce the Gaelic language here? This Gaelic language was spoken up and down the Strath up until 200 years ago. Can we reassess the intensity of the management with people in it, people being in the landscape, managing it less? Enhancement of the environment, restoring the degraded peatlands, perhaps new carbon crofts, rewilding the landscape. And this doesn't have to be 18th, 17th century subsistence lifestyle. This is new people in the landscape working remotely with technology, with internet connections. Is it possible under the current land ownership scheme? Probably not. However, community ownership, the legitimate place of people in landscape with social, economic and cultural considerations as well as environmental. Would it be attractive to the current landowners? I'll leave that to them. My second provocation is introducing the Gaelic language or reintroducing protecting. Gaelic is the language of this landscape and I'm told I'm not a Gaelic speaker, but I'm told that you need the Gaelic language to be able to see this landscape in color. I looking at this landscape as an English speaker only see it in black and white. I need a um, dictionary to be able to transcribe this landscape, the place names. It informs and describes our understanding of how the landscape is or could be. And for example, I've taken one example from an area that I know really well. Um, this is the place of the cows in Gaelic. However, it's wild land area 39 in English. It could tell us about where the area could be restored in terms of trees or productive ground or boggy ground. But the Gaelic language has been eradicated in some places and it's been lost through lack of support and perhaps um, through more than just lack of support. We know that ecological knowledge is woven into language and culture, and this is passed from generation to generation. The, I have an example here for Gaelic language being used to protect the seas. If language is lost, ecological knowledge is lost. Do we need to focus on language to save the environment? My third provocation is more community land ownership. So I'm a director of Community Land Scotland and our vision is for the community ownership of land and buildings to be a significant driver of sustainable development across the whole of Scotland. The landscapes are not socially just without dealing with the land question. We need diversification. Community can and do lead and benefit more through democratic ownership of land and assets. And we are better at tackling social, economic and environmental issues better. There's a ex brilliant example of this, and it's a recent report by colleagues in Hermitford Community Land Scotland looking at community landowners' response to the climate emergency. And uh, we found um, that community landowners respond well beyond um, other landowners in responding to the climate emergency. So there's legitimacy, uh, just to sum up, there's legitimacy in scrutinizing current landscapes against the backdrop of clearance and looking back to times when some people would argue the last of the indigenous people were here. Landscapes of clearance are still perpetuated by concentrated land ownership policy and public perception. The landscapes need to be socially just and environmentally just. And this could be achieved partially because there's a lot more to this story than I've managed to squeeze into this presentation around repeopling ecological knowledge and language and community ownership of land. Thank you very much. I have not had a timer on, so I don't know if I've gone over or under there, but hopefully that was enjoyable and I would um, really like to pick up some of these themes in the question and answer. Thank you, Magnus. I think I'll hand it over to Indrani now. Okay, so it's an honor to be here with all of you today and share other people's knowledge and, um, and your opinions. Um, so I'm Indrani Sigamani and I shall be speaking on the legal foundations of displacement of indigenous peoples in India from their ancestral lands. So I'll, I'll first introduce who indigenous peoples are in India, then touch about upon how the law has been used to expropriate indigenous lands I'll talk a little more in detail about the Forest Rights Act of 2006 and the importance of connection of land ecology and sustainability of the land for indigenous communities is a main focus of my talk. 
So indigenous peoples in India are referred to as Adivasis and literally the meaning is first nation. They're also referred to in India as tribals or scheduled tribes. They're ancient, sorry, I should tell you the next slide. Um, I must like three cam. They're ancient communities of India and they live primarily in hills and forest lands. And there are 84 million tribals in India, which is about 8.6% of the Indian population, according to the 2011 census. So that forest dependent livelihoods, they gather minor forest produce, they engage in slash and burn agriculture, there are pastoralists who herd animals. And all of this is a continuation of ancient subsistence lifestyles. Next slide. Um, Adivasi lands, 72% of forest lands in India are Adivasi lands, which are resource rich. And the poverty of the forest tribes is particularly unjust given that 80% of India's minerals 90% of India's coal mines and over 3,000 hydroelectric dams belong to Adivasis, belong on Adivasi lands. But, and this is a provocation, they do not enjoy any of the profits of all this extractive industry. The profits go to private corporations or to the government, but the government doesn't necessarily plow this back in to into tribal communities, which means that they're very impoverished. Slide five, next please. During the colonial period, forests were discovered as being a substantial source of revenue and Adivasi lands started being expropriated for, for extractive industry. The colonial government enacted legislation that facilitated this economic exploitation, which was the start of what we call ecological imperialism and the beginning of dispossession of customary land rights and displacement of indigenous peoples from ancestral lands. Um, so this new legislation actually, because they displaced the forest tribes from their lands, when they were when they came back to follow their livelihoods they were actually criminalized because there was they were legally not allowed and they were look, considered encroaching upon forest lands which actually was their own ancestral property next slide please after independence from colonial rule the indian government continued these policies of displacing indigenous forest peoples from their lands and the colonial jurisprudence actually strongly influences the legal environment in post-colonial India till today. And so the displacement now is not only taking place for large scale industrial extraction, but also in the name of conservation. So that is a dichotomy. Um, and there's new legislation in India that, has, that reflects this. Um, recently, we have a paradigm shift towards recognizing indigenous lands with the Forest Rights Act and the Land Acquisition, Rehabilitation and Resettlement Act, which is 2013, so quite recently. And I'll talk a little more about Forest Rights Act in a minute. The next slide. The results of displacement actually has been extreme impoverishment of Adivasis. And there's been the combined forces of colonial forest resource extraction, contemporary free market economic development and the conservation policies, which means that more than 40% of land expropriated for development and mining belongs to tribal communities in India. And roughly between 100,000 and 300,000 forest peoples have been displaced from their lands, which means that they are fully or partially deprived of their sources of livelihood and survival. And there's another thing which doesn't affect mainstream populations, but does affect um, tribal populations is that there's this 
spiritual cultural connection to their ancestral lands that mainstream populations just do not comprehend. So it's more than livelihoods and more than habitat, which means that 85% of them right now live below the official poverty line and a lot of them face starvation. Another aspect is that ethnobotanical knowledge and gender roles have been eroded by land expropriations since forest lands have become sovereign property, which was way back in the 17th century, 18th century. Next slide, please. So in 2006, the Forest Rights Act was enacted and indigenous land rights were recognized for the first time in India. The Forest Rights Act is a landmark social justice law. It aims at land tenure security for forest peoples, which is very, very important. Um, it's probably contemporary India's largest land regime change, and it restores customary rights. It recognizes historic injustice of land dispossessions of Adivasis. This was actually really important for the Adivasis in principle to be able to say that there has been historic injustice since the 17th, since the 18th, 1700s. It offers women equal land ownership and it recognizes community land rights, which Magnus also spoke about. This is really important because Adivasis the tribal populations, they, they behave communally, they, you know, they work the land, they use the land in a communal manner. So it's basically progressive um, piece of legislation which is articulated in rights-based language. Next slide, please. So the ecological dimensions of the Forest Rights Act is really important for this particular unlearning at the moment in, in Glasgow, um, it, the, the, the legislation actually calls to, for a more structured conservation approach. Now that's very progressive and it obliges increased tribal participation in how they manage their forest lands. So it's moving away from ecological imperialism. Um, it's actually considered a new paradigm of conservation. And I'll just talk very briefly about it. So there's this classic paradigm, which argues that people cause destruction of biodiversity and they degrade the forest environment. And this thinking, the classic paradigm is what established the wildlife parks and natural reserves, games, game reserves, etc. The new paradigm, views people as central to the protection of nature. And it points to the importance of human participation in conservation practices to achieve sustainability. I remember when I was um, actually one of my, the first uh, visits to the, a deep village in Rajasthan, remote deep in the forest, there was a, this old man and he was standing there and he with this walking stick and he looked at me and he said, where there are forests, there are tribals and where there are tribals, there are forests in India. And it just really hit home to me, you know, because you wouldn't have forests if people degraded them, their, their own environment. And there's this interconnectedness. They, they, they need the forests, so they have to protect them. Next slide, please. So the gender perspective, how does being displaced from the land affect women differently? And this is another provocation. We're looking at it um, outside the Con the conventional patriarchal structure, indigenous women are the knowledge holders of natural resource management, food, medicinal plants, and women are the traditional custodians of forest biodiversity. So when lands are lost, women lose their self-reliance in food production. They also lose their knowledge in natural resource management, biodiversity, medicinal plants which is not only a loss to women and to the ro women's role in the community, but also a loss to the whole community because women transfer that this indigenous knowledge of, you know, 
biodiversity to the next generation. So loss of land leaves women particularly vulnerable. And it's what we call feminization of poverty, which is about widening the gender gap in poverty where the inequality in living standards between men and women widen. Next slide, please. So my last provocation, I'm leaving you with a question, which is about how do the competing issues of indigenous rights on one hand and ecological conservation on the other work in harmony to ensure both forests and their inhabitants are protected? Thank you. Thank you so much, Indrani. And I think lastly, we'll have Vivian. Um, hello, everyone, and uh, thank you so much for having me. Um, again, please forgive me, it's four in the morning where I am, but uh, I'm honored to be with uh, all of you here, actually, and just uh, so inspired by the, the presentations that uh, we just heard, and at the same time, so heartbroken to see that I'm gonna just talk about the same thing that you guys talked about, except uh, it's just slightly different uh, context or rather, you know. So it, it, it makes one think about how these issues sadly uh, have been, we, we've been killing each other as a species uh, and eliminating each other. It feels like since the beginning of time, and so one has to wonder how can we, as we sit here together on the fringe, uh, think about how are we gonna break this uh, human ancestral pattern of just feeling like in order to exist, we have to eliminate. Um, and so I, I, I feel like I want to start with this question uh, as a, as an attempt to envision and design something new. And I think architecture in particular often can be a space to, uh, you know, design and think about our spaces and our lands and, and what, we, what, we, what we do in order to either promote this notion or demote it, I guess. Um, so I'm Vivian and I am from Palestine. And so the, the, the things that um, were mentioned are something that, uh, you know, I'm also living day in, day out in Palestine. And I work particularly with farmers uh, in order to find within this horrific reality where we're being ethnically cleansed, uh, where can we find our power? Where can we find our ability to uh, create these tender spaces within our harsh reality in order for us um, to survive and to salvage whatever we, we can? And so uh, while of course I recognize and I experience with my community all these horrendous tragedies and like, uh, uh, you know, it was mentioned earlier in India, for example, about how using conservation as a form of, of also kicking people off the land. Uh, we have this issue uh, in, a, in a large way. So we have many villages that we work with that have been completely eliminated in the name of conservation. And today, maybe I will speak about one particular village um, and this village is called Aimwas, and I will actually share my screen to show you uh, something. Uh, here we go. Obviously, I am not super good at this, but uh, it's beautiful, right? Present. There we go. I know how to do some things. Um, so um, 
yeah, so many of the villages in Palestine were completely destroyed in 1948 when the uh, Zionist militias basically came uh, and, and were organized and well armed uh, and went into different villages and started to you know, kill people, kick them out um, of their ta homes, but also go into other villages and uh, announcing that if you don't leave, the same will happen to you. And so many of the villages, uh, many of the people uh, left the villages in 1948 and then later in 1967, uh, not knowing what they were just running for their lives and they actually didn't know what was happening. They, they, they closed their doors and they still, until today, people that I know still have keys, like elders in their 80s, they still have keys to their homes. And so as Palestinians, we grow up, of course, with our elders, uh, like people like myself, uh, who were born after 1948 and after 1967, learning about these stories, but we can't imagine these villages that they left because we live in uh, concentrated areas, basically completely surrounded by walls. So that the, the idea of actually what, what our grandmothers are talking about is, is a strange, especially for people younger than me. Uh, who now live in a high, hyper neoliberal world. Uh, and, and that's why talking about this is impossible without talking about neoliberalism and capitalism and obviously colonialism uh, and how this neoliberal world continues to sever us from nature and our relationship to land and, and our ability to understand you know, this relationship between literally, uh, like Mariam said in the beginning, what is right underneath our feet. It's hard to see this aerial view of where we are. So um, this is, uh, I wanted to share this because uh, a few years ago, I was able to go to um, one of these destroyed villages. And uh, this village is, um, the village of Aimwas. And to get there for me as someone who is not allowed to go on certain roads because I'm Palestinian. So we have different color IDs. Uh, there are roads we can't be on. Uh, and obviously there are many cities and towns we can't enter. So I was born in Jerusalem, for example, but I, um, I, I grew up in Bethlehem and today for me to go to Jerusalem, I have to go to a military base and apply for a, a permit. If I'm allowed, then I have to go through these very um, horrendous uh, checkpoints. Uh, but I didn't do all that to go to this village. I went, uh, I was basically smuggled uh, in, a, in a car to get to this village, which is a village literally less than, um, maybe less than half an hour away from my home. Uh, and I heard a lot about this village because my neighbors uh, always talked about their village, uh, but because they were refugees, they were made refugees, their, their village was completely destroyed and they were made refugees and they became internally displaced people and refugees in Bethlehem where I grew up. And they will always, you know, their garden was always so full of beautiful pomegranates, beautiful almonds uh, and grapes that they would refer to as, uh, you know, seedlings they got from their village. So I really wanted to see this village. So I, uh, after being smuggled in a car, uh, I got to this village, which is today, if you go there and you don't know this history, it is, it looks like a, a forest. And it's a forest because um, the Jewish National Fund uh, and many uh, people around the world uh, who were convinced that they're just planting benign trees in Israel were sending money to plant trees, usually pine trees uh, that were brought actually originally by the British to Palestine. And so now you have all these villages that were destroyed and, on, and 
on top, uh, these pine, non-native pine trees were planted. So if you go to what I refer to now as Imwas, the village, uh, you will have no signs if you just fly into Israel and you drive around. Oh, it, there is no Imwas. Uh, there is, however, uh, a map that will take you to what is called Ayalon Canada uh, Park. So now it is a park where people go, hipsters, you know, camp. Um, it's a place they go grilling on the weekend. Uh, however, uh, you can, if you walk this forest, which is a village, which is what I did, uh, see still remnants of uh, stones of the homes they destroyed that they just couldn't get rid of. And so I went on this tour with this organization that was trying to raise awareness about how these villages were destroyed, but what they were showing us were the remnants of, of homes, basically stones. Sometimes you see pipes coming out of, uh, of the ground because this is where you can see like there was a house and uh, uh, or the stones. And so I found myself, however, in this today forest of finding these plants that were basically, if, if they were in a, they couldn't be in a forest such as a pomegranate in the middle of the forest or an almond tree or a carob tree or a sumac bush. And so I verged away from the group and I started to just walk the path based on this map that you see here. This is a map that was drawn, uh, it's obviously hand-drawn, uh, but it's from the memory of the people who were displaced from the village of Aimwas. And as you can see, uh, all these dots, they refer to, um, actually it's in Arabic obviously, but it's all like the home of Muhammad uh, Abu Shaukat, uh, names of people. So it's, it's names of people and there was, in the memory, when we when the memory of the people of their village was translated, uh, obviously you can see that nobody referred to the size of their home or the size of their plot. You can see they're all equal dots. Like it wasn't about, uh, oh, we had a big house in Aimwas, or it was about just this was, we were the neighbors of so-and-so, we were, uh, we, we lived close to the well or, you know, the references was, were clearly references that indicate a, a very intimate relationship to a community that uh, lived with the land. So I followed basically the smells and the, uh, of these uh, indigenous uh, cultivated plants that I'm familiar with being Palestinian and growing up with them. And so I went back later again uh, to what is today a national park uh, and followed basically this map. And in the process, I was able to find at least 19 plants that actually tell the story that this couldn't have been a forest. Uh, this, there must have been a very uh, vivid uh, agrarian society here. And uh, this is basically just a, a sketch of some of these uh, plants that I was able to find. But that kind of made me think about how also nature or, or trees can be used both as uh, the, the criminal and also they are the victims. So the almond trees uh, that have survived because their seed just fell and we're able to survive the forest. And as you know, when, when you forest an area, it becomes really hard to cultivate it for uh, things like uh, almonds and uh, apricots. Um, but they sort of survived. They, you know, a few of them survived. And it's kind of, you want to learn from the seeds that have managed to survive this overwhelming overtake, right? Uh, and then to also think about the trees and how like these pine trees that the British brought uh, and, and these Europeans bought from uh, in order to forest uh, basically and hide the evidence that a people lived there. Uh, 
you know, how they are used as weapons of war as well. And, and like was mentioned before, uh, how the conservation becomes also uh, a nasty word because with it, governments now, uh, you know, take over lands and displace people. And this is not so foreign um, to us, sadly, at all in Palestine as well. Uh, as I speak to you, I run the Palestine Heirloom Seed Library, like Mariam just mentioned, and we work with farmers in uh, different villages. Uh, this village, uh, for example, that uh, this picture here, uh, this is uh, Abu Nidal. He is uh, a farmer who lost 180 trees. Uh, if you see to this, this, the interruption of this landscape, uh, to, to the right, all this barbed wire and, and this road, this is not just a sweet little road. This road is the military road where today, this is an old picture actually, uh, when they started, when they took his land, uh, more than 65% of the people of this village, uh, uh, more than 65% of the land has been already taken away. And by the way, they are already displaced people from their original village. So they are now being made refugee for the third time in their home country in Palestine. And this road was carved through this beautiful uh, biohabitat, as you can see. Uh, and now it is an erect six feet high, um, um, six feet, uh, how do we, six meter high, uh, wall that is being guarded by uh, military all the time. And so uh, for Abu Nidal, for example, here we were trying to forage for lofete, which is uh, uh, a wild uh, green that we eat. Our, our cuisine was very much based on a lot of foraging, which has become now impossible because we can't access these lands. Uh, but here we are foraging next to what is uh, uh, now uh, a high wall guarded by the army. And the act of foraging itself has become a very dangerous act, uh, which could potentially, basically, you could risk your life. Uh, in fact, I wanted to show um, one image about that. Uh, you can see in this image, uh, Basically, uh, I think the image speaks for itself. Uh, this is a man foraging for mallow uh, in Palestine. And the army comes with, like you see, machine guns uh, to basically kick you off the land. And a lot of women, for example, that have lived off of uh, foraging and selling uh, the the foods they foraged have also been severed from these lands, obviously, um, and, and often are faced with a lot of violence from, from the army. Um, another case for us, so basically, uh, this is happening all over uh, Palestine, particularly all over the West Bank, actually, of, uh, of basically people being forced off their lands in all kinds of manners, whether it's uh, by uh, settlers who are subsidized by the Israeli government who come and take over and then, uh, and they invest also particularly in agribusiness. So you can see this image, uh, this is, this used to, this is in the Jordan Valley and this used to be a very, believe it or not, diverse and lush area because there are lots of natural springs there. Um, and it used to be the bread basket for uh, a lot of the West Bank. You know, we're talking about aubergines, uh, all kinds of things that, you know, because their growing season was longer because of the warmth. Uh, farmers there have been completely uh, taken out. Uh, and now this is really, their farms are transformed into desert, as you can see. Uh, and this is all for uh, agribusiness. So this is a settlement, uh, date plantation. And so now the farmers who 
uh, practiced uh, agrobiodiversity are now basically day laborers in these uh, monocrop agribusiness huge farms uh, subsidized by the Israeli government, run by Israeli settlers. Uh, sometimes they're from Argentina, they come from you know, all over the world. They, you know, they claim ownership and uh, this is what happened. Um, and just to go back to this, um, this is, for example, uh, so the farmer, the, the land that I was just showing you uh, is, a, is now a desert, but this is a picture from the 80s when uh, they still could farm their land and the water actually runs through their their village, uh, and yet they're not allowed to use it. So you have a whole uh, collection of villages that are, the villages themselves are disappearing because they're dying of thirst basically. And they have to go uh, and in trucks, the water literally runs underneath their, it's in their village, uh, but they're not allowed to use it. And so they're being severed from their water source. They have to buy water from the Israeli private company, uh, uh, the Israeli, sorry, water company. Um, it, and so obviously you can see it becomes impossible to farm in these circumstances. I share uh, these images and obviously there's a, there's a lot to, to share and talk about. Uh, here with all these connections, um, but all to say that in the midst of all of this, uh, what, what we're trying to do is basically salvage this knowledge, uh, tell these stories, but also uh, try to save these, whatever space we can in order to keep our seed heritage alive um, and in order for us to be able to pass down to the children that will come next, at least these, like I said, tender spaces that they can work with. Uh, in my work, I've been trying to basically excavate the stories of our seed heritage in order to learn about who we are and, and dispel the lies that we've been told by colonial powers that who we are was worthless, meant nothing, uh, and actually reclaim that. And so pass down to uh, new generations, this knowing that actually we have something very precious, uh, not just to have, but also to share with the rest of the world. And I think uh, hopefully with that connections that, that are made through this knowledge and through this awareness that is expanding, like us sitting here together today, even through Zoom and understanding that a future for the world uh, and a future where we end colonialism uh, is gonna require us sharing, uh, sh unlearning all the lies we've been told by colonialism uh, and then uh, creating and designing a new world that uh, we can share together beyond uh, concepts of nationalism, but also with respect to, to how we have had a relationship with land as indigenous peoples. So thank you for listening to me. And if uh, I'm really excited to, to have a conversation. Thank you so much, Vivian. That was really beautiful. Um, so I'd like to start by asking our panelists a few questions. First of all, I'd like to thank you for not only allowing us a view into your complex and ongoing practices and research, but also offering us a glimpse of your own identities, like who you are, um, and your sense of belonging to these places or barriers to these senses of belonging as well. So one of the threads that seems to connect all of you is your dedication to developing systems of care and recognition for ancestral knowledge. Uh, Magnus works through the local language of Gaelic, which is deeply rooted in the landscape um, and our relationship or uh, relationship to landscape in rural Scotland. And Drani also aims to empower and protect the traditional keepers of spiritual and ecological knowledge in the Andrivasi communities, indigenous women who are often dis disproportionately affected or disadvantaged by displacement and poverty. And then we have Vivian, 
who works through cultivating heirloom seeds that were intentionally bred and like protected by her ancestors to withstand um, violent settlement, chemical expansions. So their encoded DNA has seen history beyond us and may outlive us as well. Um, to quote Robin Wall Kimmer um, from Braiding um, Sweetgrass, she talks about how plants are passed from hand to hand to earth to hand across years and generations and thrive along disturbed edges. So can you each speak more about the relevance of ancestral knowledge to your work and to your contexts and the continuation of ancient lifestyles as well? Um, I guess, oh, go ahead. Um, just, um, I'm quite happy to, to go first here if it gives others some time. Um, so, um, just for, uh, hopefully that came across in the presentation that much of the landscape that we live in is, um, that I live in here in the North Highlands is um, degraded. This obviously has a lot of impacts when we think about the climate crisis, biodiversity crisis. And um, so we need to restore much of this landscape. Um, the pictures I showed, a lot of people think this is a wild and beautiful landscape, but it is largely managed by people, whether it's deer, whether it's sheep, whether it's trees, whatnot. Um, so we need to restore this landscape, um, whether it's restoring peatlands or trying to um, restore natural woodland. Um, so we need to try and understand what goes where, what should be restored where um, best. And um, we've got a, a, a whole book in front of us written in the Gaelic language in terms of the Gaelic place names, um, which describe the landscape, whether it's the place of the cows, that's probably more um, people orientated in terms of the, 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 the livestock aspect. But you could have the, the, the hill of the birch tree or something, um, and that could be describing a now degraded landscape where no trees exist because the deer or the sheep numbers have been too high. But we know that birch will grow well on that hillside. Um, or we could have um, lots of different examples, the, 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 the um, flat piece of bog land. Uh, again, um, I don't have the Gaelic to be able to describe it because I'm not a Gaelic speaker. Um, but if we've drained that, for example, for agriculture, we know that perhaps we could re reblock that landscape and re reform the peat bog, which is hugely important um, in the both climate and ecological sense. So we've got this blueprint for what a more um, environmentally just landscape could look like right in front of us on the maps with these Gaelic place names, which are used to describe the landscape. In English, the place names don't describe the landscape nearly as well as the Gaelic place names do, which is a very descriptive language. Um, yeah, that was so beautiful, Magnus, because I think about a lot um, as we speak, actually. Uh, so our seed library is in a village called uh, Batir. And uh, so, and, and the village itself, because of the uh, apartheid policies, basically, of the state of Israel, we have uh, a lot of lands that have been designated as state land and or area C, they call it uh, after the Oslo agreement, which means we are not allowed to build on it. We're not allowed to really access it freely. Uh, and it is uh, administered by the army, which is basically more than 70% of our lands. Um, and so for us going to farm is uh, quite a challenge. But the reason I bring this up because um, we have been uh, developing an agroecological site in one of the hillsides of the village. Uh, and uh, close to that hillside is another uh, piece of that land that uh, we call Dil Berda, which we, it has a name because it describes uh, it, it, it describes very particularly, even though we are in the same hill, uh, what, what it is about there. Um, and it, it just means that this is the colder part. I mean, that's the name. The name is like the colder part of the hill. Um, or actually it's called Berdamot, which means it is, it's so cold, it's the death cold. Like it's, it's just to say that is the coldest part. 
Um, and we also have a lot of wild foxes that actually uh, like to hang out there. Um, but with in recent uh, months, we've had this a settler who's been coming uh, to our site and to the area uh, fully armed uh, with the protection of the Israeli army. And we can't do anything about it. Uh, so a lot of the farmers and the people of the village, we, they stay up all night uh, keeping a fire in order to like at least prevent this person from coming. But of course he comes and he bulldozes trees and all of that. I'm getting to the question. Uh, the reason I mentioned this is because one of the farmers we work with, his name is Ghassan, uh, he, he has a 12 year old son and I learned everything I know from my grandmothers, from women in my community who I would go to the field with, to the mountain with. So I didn't learn to forage through an app. I learned to forage through smelling, touching, and learning from others who taught me that this is edible, this is not, if the leaf feels like this, it's okay, it's not. Um, so this 12 year old, uh, who used to go with his father, Ghassan, uh, to the mountain, uh, now hates, he hates going there because one night he witnessed uh, his father being beaten by the army while trying to prevent the settler from going into his well and pissing in it. Uh, and so then his father and his elder brother were taken to prison for 12 days and tortured. Uh, so you're talking about a kid now who's 12, who's not only like has trauma about going back to land, for him land is, is associated with uh, the loss of his father. And he doesn't, uh, you know, his father was sharing with me that he doesn't sleep at night uh, until his father comes home. and when you talk to him about going to a tree or going to land, for him, that's the most horrible experience in his mind. So you have practices uh, that are severing us from our ancestral knowledge. And so in the work that uh, I do, I try to kind of uh, often tell the story in a new way or kind of engage a lot of young people who may not necessarily have had as much of a trauma as this 12 year old, but they still have the trauma of, of all the other things, or they've been completely severed from like the people who were the kids who were born uh, 16 years ago, uh, they don't know what, uh, what the landscape actually looked like. They think that, uh, it was always concrete like that, uh, or that you know there were always these walls, but there weren't always these walls. Uh, and so I think our ancestral knowledge and, and being able to excavate it and put it in contemporary forms that relate to new generations uh, is really, really important, but also um, cultivating the ancestral energy and power to to make people feel like it's worth, it, it's not just worth saving, it's also worth fighting for. Sorry, I talked too much, but uh, I'll, I'll let the floor. Uh, Indrani, were you saying something? Sorry. Um, just to answer your question, Miriam, um, the, I talked about in, in my talk, I gave, a few examples of how important bio, the pr protection, the preservation of biodiversity is for indigenous forest peoples because their livelihood, their habitat, every, their whole culture is, is actually inextricable from the health of the forests. And um, so as like I gave that example where, you know, the forested lands is where the Adivasis live and, and they have kept it alive. And there are also, for instance, um, mobile indigenous people such as um, camel herders in the Aravali Hills where I did some of my field work. And you know, those photos on my slides, that's all from my, my field work. Um, so there's this sort of very intricate 
um, relationship of keeping the, the desert, because the, the uh, Rajasthan is partly desert where the camels have their grazing corridor, and for instance, the, the, the settled farmers have this relationship with, with the nomads, with the mobile indigenous peoples, where they will allow them these grazing corridors through their fields. And this is traditional. So it's like the, you know, in, in England, you have the public right of way, where even if it goes through people's farmlands, people can trek there. Um, and so the, the camel herders will come through and they will graze, but their camels will actually, through their dung, drop the seeds. And that will later, you know, um, the, the, the seeds will grow. And so there's this sort of replenishing and there's this relationship of, you know, keeping this biodiversity alive that just, you know, they have this knowledge that that goes way back. And for instance, in forests we have in India, we, we people say, well, that's a sacred grove or that's a sacred pond. And it feels like it's religious or it's spiritual, but actually what it is, is that sacred grove is probably the foundation for a lot of seeds or the sacred pond is the, you know, is where, where a lot of the wildlife, um, the, the, the water-based wildlife spawn. And they also have very strict rules because um, the hunter gatherers, you cannot hunt, for instance, in the spring when, when, um, when the animals are uh, mating and, you know, are, are giving birth. And that these are traditions that are actually not acknowledged by uh, mainstream society, not acknowledged by the government who will go in. And, um, you know, if, if in, in Orissa, they had a, a, a mine, a copper mine, a bauxite actually in a sacred grove and, in, in, and they were just going to mine that. And, um, and there were huge, uh, and it became national protests where they blocked off highways so that people, so that the government could no longer, you know, go in there and mine. And the, the Forest Rights Act has a very, very important aspect to it. And that is the self-determination. They have the Gram Sabas, which are the village councils. And the, <coughs> the Forest Rights Act gives the Gram Sabas a right, a voice, to say you, the, you know, anybody is allowed or not allowed, it's to, 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 um, to take land. The problem is um, that the, you know, the free prior informed consent is not being used by the government and the current government is actually trying to repeal that. And even in the, the land acquisition and of the land acquisition, rehabilitation and resettlement is quite a mouthful, 2013, um, it feels like, you know, rehabilitation and resettlement is a good thing. But if you look at it very critically, um, it, it has the way the current government has used it. And um, actually Vivian talked about, you can't separate what's happening from the neoliberal, you know, big capital um, aspect of corporate industry, extract, extractive industry of forests. And so um, the, it, if you talk about resettlement and if you focus about on resettlement and rehabilitation, it kind of legitimizes that you can actually take that land. You take that land and you resettle and you, re, you, know, you, you rehabilitate the population. So the focus is on resettlement and rehabilitation. It's no longer whose land are you allowed to be on this land? Are you, do you have the consent of the people who own that land? So I'll stop there. Thank you so much. And I like really enjoyed the variety of answers that you each address the different parts of the, the question because it was kind of like a really large overarching unanswerable sort of question. Um, I think one thing also is that 
as illustrated by Vivian Sex, sort of really, um, really heavy and also grim story about the settler um, in these kind of like policed um, spaces that were once home. Um, Vivian also used this really beautiful term, which is like tender spaces within harsh realities. So both, I think, something that is shared between the contexts of both Vivian and Indrani is this kind of underlying colonialism um, and this working within spaces that are facing real and violent destruction, erasure, and this encroaching violence um, from the Nagla to ongoing, the ongoing apartheid and occupation from Britain's colonial violence in India to Modi's fascist regime you're both working within environments and politics that are heavily like alive and active in, in kind of despising and abhorring the, the people you're working with and the, the lands you're working with. Um, something like, I mean, that's really interesting, but how do you find, how, how do you continue to work towards gaining self-determination, also empowering others towards self-determination? with this very reality, like while working against this very reality, um, especially with kind of the shared contexts between Palestine and India. I hope that, that makes sense. <laughs> it does. I think we're, we're in a different, oh, may I go? <laughs> of course. Right. So we're, we're in a different stage in terms of, um, you know, it's been, it was 1947 when we got independence and in Palestine right now it's 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 colonized at the moment and there is you know an apartheid state at the moment so I think it's different but I also in India I think that you know the there's India was a, a poor country it's now considered a middle-income country um the fact that it's middle income um, and that you know there's been industrial development has not actually um, affected, unfortunately, the poverty. So that you know it's a certain class of people or classes of people who have um, who, who who you know the economic elite who have thrived. But when you go to the villages, the tribal villages, and you see, um, I was doing the, the photos in that, um, in the slides are from 2014, when I was doing my data collection in India, and I was thinking, gosh, it's 2014, it's, you know, 20, 21st century, there was no running water, there was no electricity the houses were still mud huts with thatch. And you could get through the Indira Gandhi scheme, you could get um, you know, a grant to build a, what we call pakka housing, which is you know, um, solid housing. But when you looked around, there was just one house in that very remote village, which was a pakka house. And it was just being half built. It was just half built. So, um, there is this huge dichotomy in India. There's a, there's a gap, there's a huge inequality gap. And I think inequality is a vital word, concept for, um, for, for as a lens to look at, um, you know, justice. And, you know, I look at legislation. You, how, how do you access justice using legislation? And how does, um, you know, something like the Forest Rights Act or the LARR, how do they actually, um, how, how do people use it? I mean, if you think of, for instance, women, and in, in, in there's huge gender connotations here, women are more illiterate than men in general. Um, they are also legally illiterate, the, and because of the patriarchal structure, if they if they try to fight for their rights, it's you know a lot of times the forest department whom they come again as like the the first port of contact in in the forests in India. They uh, they're, they're staffed predominantly by men who will treat the women differently. And there's more violence in the way they treat them and there's more threats. 
And in, for instance, the, I'll give you a quick example in Chamba district in the, in the Himalayas, in the lower Himalayas, they were building this, this dark dam on the Ravi River. And, um, and they, last minute, they changed it. They changed the direction so that the dam was actually going to be on the part where there was settlement, the, the, the tribal people were settled. And it was really interesting because the protests were women. The protests went on for years and it was women. And it, it goes back to what I was saying, the loss of land for women is much more severe. And it's, 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 it's sort of, you know, their lives, their, their livelihoods, their lives, it's, they're, they're truncated. Women are actually, you know, what we call reproductive roles, which is when you care for the family, you care for um, the, you know, the children, the household, the old people, all those are reproductive. But for women who are in charge of the reproductive roles, they, that's home-based. So if you take away their land, you know, what, where do they go? What, where, where do, what is their livelihood based on? So it's, um, I'm, I'm going to stop there because I'm going to go, go on and on and get very passionate about it. And I let Magnus speak. I'm not convinced I've got, um, I can answer that question very well, but I'm quite happy to pass over to Vivian. <laughs> That's funny, Magnus, because a lot of the work you mentioned uh, is in the heart of it. But uh, thank you for, for that. Um, I think your question was about how, uh, how, how kind of like you mitigate these two realities, um, which is like a one reality really. So I think for me, uh, there was a moment where, well, I realized that really there is no choice. There is a choice to surrender and just uh, accept things as they are, or like go with what most people would say, well, this is reality. Uh, and then there was another choice to say, I'm not interested in reality. I can recognize it, but I'm really not interested in it. And I, I think for me, that has uh, driven my work in, in my, you know, my desire to uh, create and be part of another world, uh, another way. And it's not that I, ha you know, it's not the way of the settler, definitely. And it's also not the way of acceptance uh, of, of a reality that I don't want to live in. So uh so there are two elements one is is uh is rejecting what is being imposed on you uh and being willing to basically die rather than live like that um or yeah so uh <laughs> i forgot what i was about to say but basically yeah i i feel like i do it through a commitment to no matter what happens and and oftentimes a lot of the work is just the grief like just going through the grief is so much you know I, I sometimes wonder if we you know what would we do if we didn't have so much grief like it's so much energy goes into grieving so a lot of times for example in my work people say oh my god this gives me hope and and it is in a lot of ways beautiful because we are trying to create again, these spaces of tenderness, and we do, uh, but what's in the background is when you're like completely devastated and in grief and, and you're overtaken by the sorrow and you're just in bed for a month. And then you have to then find your energy somehow to say, okay, I don't wanna die like this. And then, find it again and sometimes you find that power uh, and that's why community is so important and language is so important uh like magnus was saying and um and also community you know is so important because uh sometimes it's like you're just giving up and then somebody comes and makes a little fire and they make some tea and 
you're just your heart is is, is soothed and uh, and sometimes that's all you need you know to kind of remember that it's it's really worth it's really worth trying to create another way uh, of course I mean it would have been so nice if I were born somewhere where I didn't have to think about these things uh, you know I would have liked to be like a surfer girl in California but that didn't happen <laughs> uh, instead you know and it, and I've tried it doesn't really work because I you know I'm needed into the needed as in like dough into another soil and I have to respect and honor that and then also I would say the other part um, is falling in love like how do you fall in love uh, with all the things and all the people and everything you've been told isn't worth looking at even you know you should dismiss it you should destroy it you should uh, forget about the olive trees and the terraces and your cucumbers you, you know you should be looking at wearing a suit and tie and going to university and um and it really seeps into people's minds that we're not enough we're worth nothing if we don't have a, a college degree or we're worth nothing as if like everything your grandmother fed you wasn't actually the product of pure science and imagination and magic uh, so i think uh yeah being willing to fall in love with something that you know may be dying uh is is a is a for me, it is the, the hardest work and the most pleasurable work. Vivian, wow. <laughs> um, I'm almost tearing up, but uh, I really like, kind of loved what you said about there's like this no choice but to just to survive because disappearing is not an option. Um, and how essentially you are all defiant by rejecting the unjust reality and proposing new worlds, as Vivian was saying, um, unsettling these existing worldviews, which we keep investing in as normative modes of existence. Um, these like so, sort of like recursive systems that are like genocidal, ecocidal, but we act as if they're unalterable and continue to invest in them. But instead you were each through your strategies, through your love and your grief, rejecting these and proposing alternatives to like longevity and to a new way of being, like unlearning the current system. And oh, to be a surfer girl. <laughs> um, I really, really, I really enjoyed like how- I do love surfer, I do love surfing <laughs> and I do love surf, surfing girls. This is not a comment on that. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to as well. <laughs> Um, but I think another thing that is also, um, again, all of these things are getting sort of like really in depth into your personal research and your personal sense of belonging and your struggle within these spaces. But it is also becoming evidently um, evident that it's like increasingly important to recognize and support locality, uh, not simply to preserve its traditions, but also to innovate in service of legality. So as cultural practitioners, you're each invested in working directly with these specific landscapes, spaces, localities, even if space for some of you is not directly on land, you might be displaced. Um, so how are you each advantaged or disadvantaged or complicated by your positionality, um, either as indigenous or as Magnus mentioned, unindigenous, um, as being present in your homeland, or, or this idea of homeland, or displaced, or um, as Vivian mentioned, having a barrier of entry and access to spaces within home. So what is this kind of feeling of, like what is the role positionality plays in your work? Can I go? Um, I am alien in the way of, I'm not indigenous and, studying land rights for indigenous peoples, I have to be really aware that I bring mainstream biases into my research. And it, it really hit me um, when I was um, 
I, I was in, in these villages and one of the things that, well, one of, you know, you have, you have a forest, you have lots of hamlets and then you have like a bigger village and, and there were schools and those are sort of relatively new. So there were these little kids and they were running around in these blue uniforms and I asked a question, um, how, you know, I, I said, so these children will study and they will want to go to university. And what is the future in, you know, will they be disconnected from their forest roots um, because they will go away? And I asked this question several times before I realized that, it was completely inappropriate and completely irrelevant because most of the, all of the time, I didn't get an answer. People would just look at me and I realized they don't comprehend the concept of leaving the land, of going away to university. And then, you know, as Vivian said, how do you, you know, fall, fall in love I mean, when you're told, um, you know, with, with your environment, when you're told that you have to put on a suit and tie and go away. But that was just such an alien concept. And, and there, were, there are two things. Um, one was, you, you know, we have our biases and we have our priorities, but they don't, they're not shared. They're absolutely not shared. And there's a, there's a people here and they might be, you know, impoverished by governance and or, or poor governance or lack of governance and they might be starving but they have they have a wealth that we don't understand we don't even see you know a wealth of of that is surrounds them that's part of the forest that's part of their subsistence economy that they are actually very committed to very, very committed to the, the whole biodiversity. And that's something that's an, an unlearning that, you know, I personally <laughs> had to go through, but it's something that's really valuable, which we don't actually value in, in at least, you know, I, I think that's pretty, pretty global, but in India it's, it's, and another, the second point I want to make, I don't want to take too much time, but is that, when I was doing my field work and um, I realized, you know, that you, you, have for, you have legislation like the Forest Law Rights Act and, you, and it's progressive and it's rights-based. So, so it's a new paradigm. People's uh, land rights are, are now being recognized. You know, you have a right. And, um, but at the same time, there's a difference between having legislation that's strong and actually implementing it or, or, or um, having access to justice. And that step is not quite smooth as yet. And, um, and I realized that, you know, in the 1700s till 1947, um, the forests were actually sovereign property, the British, you know, the, it was called scheduled scheduled areas, which is why the tribes are called scheduled tribes. And, um, but right now with independence and Indian, Indian government, it's actually no different for them. So it's almost like internal colonization. They are still being displaced from their land. You know, they're still impoverished. They still have no rights. And you, it makes you wonder, it, it really makes you wonder at, at the, at the, disempowerment that governments can produce for whole communities in, in, in countries. Can I jump in and quick, I'll add a wee bit, a wee bit more um, to mine. What, what role does positionality um, play in my work? So where I'm from here in the Highlands, um, we've had a problem which has been called the Highland problem and it's around youth migration and depopulation. So um, over the last 60 years, um, young people have left to go to university and haven't come back. Some people say it's been solved, but it's really wider regional statistics masking what is still exists as a problem here in the North Highlands. 
so I'm one of the few, or maybe that's not fair, but I'm one of the people who actually left and have come back. Um, so I'm the youngest of three brothers and I'm the only brother that actually came back after having leave leaving. Um, so I think that gives somewhat of an understanding and what makes the area attractive to return to and seeing some of those um, benefits. There's also this sense of place, which I find really interesting from a, 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 a um, genealogical point of view. Um, so I'm six generations removed, five or six generations removed from um, my ancestors who were displaced from this land. Um, but I don't actually have a personal affinity to the areas which they were cleared from. My personal affinity is actually a different area which I showed the pictures of, which I have no family connection to. Um, so I like to think that that also adds this inclusivity um, to, 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 to allowing people who have maybe don't have a connection with the area Area, still or a, a, a personal family connection to the area still to be able to feel that sense of place to feel like they could have a role in that uh, landscape have a place have a home in that landscape and um, so there is just some aspects of positionality that benefit the work um, and even in a, a very practical sense say for example I as an academic um, go and speak with the local people around who maybe work the land and um, because of even my accent, if I'm sat next to a colleague with a different accent, um, they turn and they look to me because they, just because of the accent that I've got, that's who they turn to, talk to, and um, feel like they can trust. That's got both pros and um, pros and cons to it, but it's just um, a, 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 um, a result of my accent and working in this, this area. Um, so it was a really interesting question, but I'll, I'll cut it short on that one. Vivian, would you like to speak to this? Uh, sure. I, I've been thinking, listening to Andrani and uh, Magnus about this question, uh, especially what Andrani said about um, being aware of what you what you bring, you know, what you bring when you are in community. Um, well, I find myself often in a multiple positions. Um, um, and, and sometimes it's crazy making, uh, and sometimes I see it as a great privilege, and sometimes I see it as a great curse. So it depends um, on the day. Uh, but um, so, yeah, because so in Palestine, I am like everybody else in my community, I cannot move around. I have a different color license, uh, an ID like all Palestinians in the West Bank. Uh, my car has a different color license plate. So where I go is completely limited like everybody else. Um, and, and yet what I do have is um, an American passport. So that when I can get out, then I am, uh, able to go you know wherever I want basically and that that is uh such a dissonance sometimes uh between the imprisonment I feel inside and the freedom I feel outside and I often wonder when I'm at airports like well I'm the same individual I'm the same human being but if I presented you with my Palestinian ID I would have been rejected um so it makes me think of like the global disgusting way we've designed the world. Um, but, but, but at the same time, that often is a question I have to ask myself. So even though I struggle often even with guilt, like I have this ability to sit by a river, to go to the ocean, uh, a lot of people I love very much as I'm sitting and talking with you here today, they don't, they don't have the, even the, the, the ability to go find it. Just actually before I got on this call, I got a call from a, a dear friend in Bethlehem who was just so emotionally exhausted. And she's like, I just want to go sit under a tree. Can I go to your farm? And I'm like, of course, just go and, and you know, sit under an almond tree it's not 
a huge, um, but the fact that I have an almond tree to sit under within my own community already also gives me another level of uh, privilege. Um, and so I think in my work, I feel I'm often uh, kind of dancing and swimming in, in many worlds. And one of them is obviously my role as a kind of bridge where I feel I, I often end up being able to connect, you know, connect um, with the world while we, you know, a lot of people in my community can't because of access and also of language often, um, obviously, and of a cultural understanding. So, I mean, I may be able to know how to speak to someone, you know, from somewhere else. And obviously I'm not by myself, um, so I don't know, it's, uh, I'm not sure I, I fully understand the question, but it's almost like you have to be a really good, uh, chameleon because wherever, you know, if I am faced with a settler, then I, I, you know, it doesn't matter that I can go sit by a river or, or fly to the United States. Uh, I'm faced with a machine gun. And so I have to, you know, become the survivalist and, 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 and use my knowledge of the land and my knowledge of the landscape to protect myself. Uh, if I'm placed under curfew, uh, which we often are, I also have to use my uh, position as a member of the community to rely on members of my community uh, to eat, to literally to eat. Like when I was a kid and we would have these ongoing curfews, uh, we had to depend on each other. Like in the morning, we'd find someone risked breaking the curfew and we'd find bread at our door. Uh, that was, you know, and now I'm in a role where I have to think about that, like in a time of a global pandemic, uh, and a military occupation, we are under several layers of, of, of lockdown, basically. How do I use whatever connections and abilities or I have to also share with my community? So I also know that I, yeah, uh, so I'm, sometimes I'm the underdog, sometimes I'm the one who can bridge. Um, and it's a big responsibility and at the same time I often remind myself that it's also a big honor to, to be able to even if it's in very small ways um, you know offer your the shade of your tree to somebody thank you so much I mean you've all had to shape shift either spiritually or in terms of role or position to adapt to these like indeterminate spaces and landscapes. Um, I think now I, we have to open up the floor to audience questions. Um, so I'm gonna hand it over to Reina to start picking out some questions. Hi everyone. Um, thank you so much for that. That was such a fascinating conversation to follow along. Um, uh, to go to questions, uh, I'll start in the order that they came in. in. And uh, so the first question was from David Skeen, who asks uh, specifically for Indrani, uh, were the peoples in North in northeastern Indian states subject to the same land dispossession? And is there any difference in outcomes, particularly in terms of loss of knowledge and environmental degradation? Good question. Thank you. Um, no and yes. Um, I don't quite know what happened during colonial India in the Northeast. It's, it's quite separate. But um, in, in the northeastern areas, it's, it's like predominantly tribal. So that, that, that is the mainstream population. So I don't know, I, I don't think that they have um, lost land in the way that, that um, the, the tribal populations in you know, the, uh, the other part of the subcontinent have. Um, they also have different rights and um, they have, um, I mean, they have dif different rights under the constitution and they have uh, at the moment, for instance, um, it's kind of, uh, it's kind of different because the, um, the, tr the, the tribal population in, um, 
in, in mainland India, if you want to call it that, um, are not facing the sort of, in, in Northeast, they, um, they're, they're facing a lot of the refugee crisis and, um, and, and people coming in from Myanmar, Burma, um, also from Bangladesh. And, um, and so in, for instance, when, when you talk about refugees, um, they, they are on the other side, they don't want the rights to the refugees and, and they have different different legal, um, they have different legislation. So I'm not quite sure I can answer that question very, very well, but you know, that they, I don't think they lost the land as much under, I mean, under colonial rule as much as the forests in mainland India. Thank you for that. Um, I'm going to actually club the next two together. Well, one was for Magnus, which is, is there sympathy for your provocations with the Gaelic language and advocates their organizations? Um, and another question, which is for all, um, Minty Donald asked, Miriam mentioned the book Braiding Sweetgrass. Robin Wall Kimmerer writes about learning her ancestors language and how that language places humans and other things in an entirely different relationship. There is no human and non-human. There's there are less nouns and more verbs. I think it's a great book and so interesting and important in reframing our human relations in a more than human world. I wonder how much other languages, example uh, Gaelic, which my ancestors spoke and I don't do that. Perfect, great. I'll start with that um, first one in terms, I think it was from David. Um, is there sympathy for provocations with Gaelic language advocates for um, an organisation? So I'll bounce between provocations, not in the order that um, I gave. So first of all, in terms of community ownership, we see on the Western Isles, which is now home to um, Scotland's um, kind of largest Gaelic community, the vernacular Gaelic community and um, much of the western hours are already under community um, ownership and it's perhaps um, and with some of the first community owners um, almost a hundred years ago and um, it's now almost a bit of a bit of a, a, a default um, but so I think there's a, a, a lot of sympathy and um, maybe not even sympathy they're, they're they're just already doing it very very well um, in terms of repeopling, again, we see through the Land Settlement Act of 1818 in Scotland, again, um, they've already done repeopling, they've done settlement, um, and they've they've done it already. Um, but again, I would say that there, there is a lot of sympathy. I'm working with some Gales from the Western Isles, looking at the repeopling agenda from a community perspective, community land perspective, particularly around crofting and crofting tenure. So yes, absolutely. The third and which is probably the most interesting one around Gaelic language and the environment is, um, yes, I think there's a huge amount of sympathy there for the way that we would like to look at these landscapes with the Gaelic language. And um, there's what's the most interesting part, actually, I think, out of this is how academics and environmentalists want to engage with the Gaelic community to get this understanding. And um, I think we need to work on it a lot more. And we as the university of the region for the region need to be advocating for this more. But for example, we've had student dissertation projects looking at Gaelic names for native woodland and looking at if that could be used to restore the landscape. Um, so I think there's sympathies there, some being done well, some almost the default, but some we could be working on a lot more. And I always will open my hands up and say I am more than happy to work with anybody on this who are keen to promote this, um, this, this kind of position from the Gaelic community as a non-Gaelic speaker myself. In terms of the second question, I think my last point almost sums that up. As an advocate for the Gaelic language, but as a non-native or a non-speaker myself, I'm not convinced. I, 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 I'm not. Um, I don't have enough knowledge to be able to answer that question on the actual structural points of the language. I could probably attempt it, but I, I don't think I would do it a great deal of justice. But I could quite happily point um, the the. Um, whoever asked the question, sorry, um, to, to, to people that could, if they want to email me, my email is easily found from my institutional um, page. Thank you. Um, but either Vivian or Andrani, I see both of you are muted. Um, Go ahead, Andrani. 
um, yeah, I, the, it's very complicated in India, which is, you know, subcontinent. We have 14 major languages and more than 800 dialects. So um, when, when I was, for instance, doing my um, field work, I would go along, I, I partnered with NGOs who were working with tribal communities in the forests, and I would go along with them and, and they spoke an Indian language, but, and, but they also spoke the dialect of the, the Adivasi communities. And I am from a different part of India. So I didn't understand either Rajasthani or that. And it's just like double alienation in a country like India. And if you, if you come from like a Western educated um, culture, you, you, you have, you're even more removed. And if you live abroad, it's like Vivian was saying, there are all these layers, you, you know, you're even more removed. So I, it, it's, 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 I think that's an important question because it create language creates barriers just as much as it opens up um, to allow you to communicate with other people, but the lack of language. With what happens when you Sorry. No. Thank you for that. And uh, Vivian? Yeah, um, I love this question, actually. Thank you, because um, I often find it frustrating speaking in English about um, nature. It feels so limiting for me uh, because it's so technical versus, uh, for example, Arabic, my native language is extremely descriptive when it comes to nature, like a hill. There are so many words for a hill, like it's, it's just not a hill and that's it. Um, but actually I loved uh, the person who asked the question also mentioned verb versus noun. Um, and, and that's also a really important point um, because when I think of Arabic, for example, the word environment, which was uh, basically um, introduced through a lot of so-called development uh, projects, uh, in, particularly in agriculture, uh, and you know how they're going to civilize us. You know, Europe's going to civilize us. We're going to become so civilized and we're going to love the environment the way Europe loves the environment uh, when in reality uh, it's Europe that uh, dumps uh, all their, their 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 environmental trash and food in our communities uh, but uh, so all these um, projects that are supposed to civilize us um, and make us good stewards of the land because we really need to learn from the very people who destroyed our lands <laughs> uh a induced new language also so you have terminologies also about gender by the way um they're very very disturbing actually because they don't feel natural like when you in fact uh some of these terms uh, kind of serve as a way to sever us from the natural way we describe land and you can tell uh, the difference be between uh, when someone speaks between someone who knows the land and someone who just talks about it in a in a pamphlet that they had to study and a workshop they had to take in order to uh, prove that they are civilized. Uh, but one of the main words is the word environment, like I said, uh, which is a new introduction to the Arabic world word. Uh, and, and that's not because we don't understand environment, it's because we actually, uh, and even a lot of ways we speak in Arabic, uh, there isn't this idea that there is uh, the nature and then there is us. This, this has never been the way my grandmother spoke, for example, or my mother. It's not how I grew up. I mean, I'm in my 40s, so I have more reference, but I think younger kids don't have that as much, obviously. Um, and so uh, it's very interesting because uh, we saw ourselves as part of nature. It's not like this other thing outside of us. 
so language really uh, does play a big role in kind of helping us also understand uh, our, our, our relationships and our relationship to, to, to land. Uh, and, and I just use this very particular example, but even with the seed varieties we use, uh, this is not just a wheat, it's not called uh, K24, whatever, it, it's called, for example, a wheat that I have been uh, trying to look for, is called Kaffir Rahman, which literally means the palm of the merciful. This is a name of a wheat, this is not... Uh, and, and it shows also that, uh, wow, uh, this, this wheat gives its life and its body uh, as a mercy to us to eat, uh, which is a whole different understanding from uh, the com commodification of nature and of food. Um, and so, I mean, these are just, I love this topic so much and I'd love to have a time to just, uh, talk about it but I'll just end with saying like even the word soil uh, we have many words for soil uh, and some of them people also like forget they don't use if I say thara to a, a, a 25 year old they'll be like what is that uh, although in Arabic we often refer uh, to to people as ahli thara which means uh, the people of the soil and so uh, these are really beautiful um, verbs, if you will, because being ahl thara being people of the soil, isn't uh, just a concept, it's a practice. And um, with the erosion of, of these linguistical treasures, uh, there's also an erosion of, of, of a lot of uh, beauty and harmonious relationship uh, with nature. Thank you so much. That was really, really wonderful. And um, it's it's always very interesting to learn about language. I grew up in the Middle East where I learned very quickly that actually between Arabic and both Hindi and Sindhi, the languages that I speak, there are so many commonalities. For example, you described the, the cold mountain. I think you used the word mot, which means death, which is the same in both Hindi and Sindhi. And I mean, I also know that the words for chair and onion are the same, which are very useful. <laughs> um, I know bas and khalas are, are, are the same. It means enough, yes. enough. We all, know. enough. We, we all add enough. <laughs> yes, <laughs> absolutely. Um, so the next question is from Susanna, who asks for all three, who or what will be the key drivers or next steps to enable your vision for social and eco justice, except for example, human rights? writing and implementing laws, biodiversity rationale, popular movement, etc. Can I go? Yes, please. Thanks, Susanna, for that question. Um, I think that, um, you know, the examples you've given, the human rights, I think rights is a, is a good way to do it. And encapsulating it in law gives people an added edge because <clears throat> you, you have some, you have an instrument to fight for your rights. Um, I think what's important about law is that, as I spoke about, is that you know you you can have laws which actually facilitate the expropriation of land and facilitate displacing people. So um, I think law itself isn't the answer, but actually accessing justice through law. So you you can have the Forest Rights Act, you can have the LARR in India, which are progressive laws, but one is how do you implement them in a way that is just, that is accessible for people who are, you know, for, for tribal populations, for indigenous peoples who are anyway marginalized. And they're more vulnerable because they ha are legally illiterate. And um, so I think, um, and, and also, um, you know, a government as, as has been shown at the moment in India can, can repeal aspects of the law that, and, and so you, you, you can also question how powerful is, you know, legislation 
is, you know, does it actually have it having a, a wonderful progressive, you know, well articulated law piece of legislation isn't the answer to everything. There's so much around it. But also the biodiversity rationale in your question, Susanna, um, that is a, you know, for instance, Forest Rights Act, it incorporates that. And I think that is the power of law is it's, it's actually recognized this new paradigm where people are, you can't disengage people from the, from the environment, just as Vivian was saying, and um, and recognizing that they they are central to indigenous people. Knowledge is central to preservation of biodiversity of uh, areas such as forests. Yeah, I've got a, um, it's such a fantastic question. I could deliver a module on that over a whole semester. So I'm going to focus on one very specific piece of policy. We've just had an election here in Scotland that came in between um, a, a number of political parties, but um, the political party that won, the Scottish National Party and the Green Party, um, who look like they perhaps will have a say in legislation going forward. And it's called the public interest test. And it looks like it would will be on a new land reform um, or a new land reform bill early in the next parliamentary term. And a public interest test means that anytime, say, a piece of land is bought or sold, hopefully um, it goes further than that. So not just bought or sold, but say a planning uh, change or planning permission goes on in that piece of land, it automatically triggers a public interest test. And that means that whatever you're doing or the sale of the land or doing on the land needs to meet these requirements that is in the public interest. So if I wanted to say, um, do something quite destructive to the environment, that obviously wouldn't pass the public interest test and it would fail and that could open it up to compulsory purchase by the state, for example. I would like to see that a lot of environmentalists are putting faith in the public interest test to protect the environment. I would like to see it go further and um, cover all the pillars of sustainability, social and economic as well. So I would like to see, for example, demographics in that public interest test. If that piece of land is leading to a really, um, 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 a lot of population loss, for example, or pumping up the price of house prices that leads to say economic clearance of young people because they can't afford to live there anymore. I would like to see that come under the public interest test. So that's one very small piece of policy that might become legislation that I think could be a key enabler going forward for some of what I would like to do. Um, uh, Vivian, would, would you have anything to add to that? Uh, sure, yeah. I mean, I, I guess uh, in our situation, since uh, we have, um, we really don't have a, a legal body to go to. It's not like, uh, uh, so we're, we're subject to policies of um, our, our oppressor, basically. Uh, and then we have the Palestinian Authority, which is basically an arm of, uh, uh, of the same structure. Um, so I guess for us, if I, if I remember the question correctly, like where, where do you kind of move forward in what you're building? Um, is, is basically to create, uh, again, like I said, as many uh, spaces as possible that can be sort of oases for us to work from. And they're kind of like rebellious spaces where you're uh, in, um, strengthening communal um, cooperation in order to survive. Um, but one of the things that uh, I will say that uh, we're working on right now is creating um, a, a natural reserve uh, which is almost impossible in in our case, but what we're trying to do is is create um, a public trust that allows us to, um, you know, purchase some lands and turn them into these biodiverse places or preserve them like that, so that they can be accessible to the public. Whoever wants to sit under a tree can sit under a tree, and I'm talking about really small spaces, you know. 
like the land we're starting with is only one acre, but it's worth a million dollars because there's no land. Uh, we are in, 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 in um, what's the word, enclosed uh, inside a concrete wall, basically. And so uh, people are building on top of each other and um, the terraces uh, that we grew up with are being destroyed by developers and obviously by settlers. So uh, we, we're trying to basically salvage whatever spaces we can uh, so that hopefully there will be uh, an expansion of this attempt to regenerate by the new generation and we can, the way our ancestors left us some seeds and few trees, we can have, we can at least go to sleep knowing we were better ancestors, or not better, but like decent ancestors, because I think um, the future has to find something to work with. Uh, so that's what we're working on. And actually this is a, um, a big uh, undertaking that we're going through right now. And if people wanna, support or learn more about it, um, please be in touch. Um, we'd love to uh, tell you more. Thank you, Vivian. Um, I've just noticed the time and realized that it's getting really late. I also should have possibly asked Miriam for follow-up questions, but my chairing abilities are being honed as we speak. So um, I'm, I'm just gonna hand over to Andy Summers to say a few final things. Um, thank you all. Thank you so much, everybody. Um, thanks for staying with us. We're just gonna close out now. So um, yeah, really interesting and uh, nourishing uh, discussions today. Thank you so much. I think the, the sort of summary comment uh, that uh, Vivian had noted earlier was that to unlearn that in order to exist, we have to eliminate. And I think it's trying to realize that we, we really can't be eliminating um, past knowledge and stewardship and trying to keep a plurality uh, of how we best go forward rather than sort of um, eliminating and uh, taking things out. So um, thank you so much uh, for, for the reflections. Um, the land um, vein within the core program does continue next Saturday where we'll have voices from Detroit, Glasgow and Calcutta, um, where we're exploring um, a neighborhood level uh, community knowledge and strategies for how to navigate uh, the, the systems that we have to work within land from a community level. So uh, the Govan Hill Baths, which are just along the street from me, will be taking part in that, along with the East Side Community Network in Detroit and the street vendors in Southern Avenue in Calcutta. So that's next Saturday at 12 o'clock. So please join us for that. Um, thank you so much um, to all our wonderful speakers, um, to Indrani, to Magnus, to Vivian and to Miriam. Thank you so much for being here. We really do appreciate it. Um, yes, the, the whole program is posted in the chat there. Please do join us um, across the next couple of weeks. Um, we are also all volunteers here uh, running the Architecture Fringe. So if you'd like to support us on Patreon, um, that would be super great as well. The link is in the chat there. Everything helps us uh, move forward as an organization to try and be more sustainable. Um, I hope you have a wonderful Saturday, whatever you're up to, wherever you are. Um, and I hope your Sunday is also great for you as well. But thank you again, everyone, for joining us. We really do appreciate. And I think if we want to do a little clap or however you want to do, you can turn your uh, um, sound on and just say thank you so much to everybody. Thank you.